Welcome, Modern Day Mystics fellow True Seekers, James and Justin, back again with another reaction video. Now, it's been a while, but we're going to take another look at the Redeemed Zoomer. Mm -hmm. He's got this video called The Story of the Entire Bible. Whoa. And he's, he's covered it in 16 minutes, which is pretty impressive. Incisive. But uh, no, we're going to go through, react to this, and uh, see what it's got. Hi, you live on Earth. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it, but why is it there? The Bible has a story to tell. In the beginning, before there was anything, before there was anywhere, before there was any when, there was God, who is everywhere and every when. He is isness itself, and he has everything, so he doesn't even need to create the world. I feel like you could stop there. Right there, you could stop. What do you there mean? There was God and God isness. And it's like, and then everything else on top of that is just context and stories and. I just feel like you could almost stop there in terms oh, of like okay. in, so you're, inside the like spiritual spirituality yeah. game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it's like okay, we're good, we got it. Yeah, God mm -hmm. is that's this. a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying. But, um, it definitely it definitely matches up with some like spiritual things, like. Mm -hmm. But it's lo and behold, even within systems of faith, that that is the essential idea is that there's God and there's God isness. Yeah, it's like. And several more books yeah, and chapters. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it always goes further after yeah. that. So let's uh, like and for for obvious reasons. Yeah. Let's let's you know, it's more complete. Imagine going up to someone like that that's like trying to do surgery or something and being like, "There's God and God isness." Yeah, like, there's more to it. Technical aspects. But God still created the world. Wait, no, it didn't look like that at first. It was more formless and void and very dark. But God let there be light, so now there's light. And this light stuff is pretty good, so God separated it from the darkness. And we should give these things names. Good news, the water below is now separated from the water above. Even more good news, now there's dry land. And guess what? Now there's life, just plants for now. But the plants might have cleaned up the air, so now you can see the sun, moon, and stars. That's going to be very useful. There's animals in the water. There's animals in the air. There's animals on the land. And now it's time for God's coolest creation so far. God made a human person, called Adam, and gave him an awesome garden, but he was still lonely, so God gave him a wife. These two kinds of humans are made out of the same stuff, but also different so they can have a relationship. God gave them a lot of trees, but two big important ones. They're allowed to eat from this one, because if they do, they're going to live forever. But God told them not to eat from this one, because if they do, they die. Seems like a pretty obvious choice, right? I was just wondering, did Christians ever wonder what God was doing for infinity before all this? Like, what was the story before this? Maybe spontaneously, as soon as God realized he was God, this is what happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe there was no infinity before. It's like, it doesn't matter what God was up to. Maybe as soon as God was God, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, possibility. Also, we can only think in a limited amount of dimensions. I'm yeah. sure there's more to it that we can't really fathom with gray matter. Mm -hmm. Actually, said some snake who's actually the devil, God doesn't want you to eat from this tree because you're going to become like him, and he doesn't want you to get too powerful. Okay, said Eve. Okay, said Adam. So they ate from the tree, and just like that, humanity had failed God's requirements for them. They lost access to the tree of life, which means they're going to end up dying. Humanity had sided with Satan over God, losing all rights to the life that God gave them. So nobody could blame God if he ended humanity right then and there. But God didn't do that. God promised one day Satan would be destroyed by one of their kids. But Adam and Eve already sinned, so let's see if their kids can do any better. Cain is mad at his brother Abel because Abel's better at having faith in God. God tells Cain he needs to resist sin, and Cain kills his brother. Why'd he do that? Well, you see, the problem of Adam's sin was passed down to Cain because the problem affects all of humanity. So as humans multiply, sin and evil multiply. Enough of this. God chooses the least evil guy, a guy named Noah. He's still a sinner, but he has faith in God, so he's a relatively decent guy compared to everyone else. God tells them to build a boat for him and his family, and everyone laughs at them until God makes a huge flood that kills everyone except them. But once the flood passes, God makes the rainbow the sign of his covenant. Remember that promise that Satan's going to be destroyed? God adds to it, saying he's not going to destroy the world again until then. Because now people are going to have some basic decency. God's not fixing the world yet, but he's making it a stable enough place so that he can do that in the future. So now people are not quite as evil as they were before. They're good enough that they can work together in society, but evil enough that they're going to use that to build a huge tower up to God out of their own pride. And evil people are dangerous when they're given too much power. So God makes the whole tower thing fail by dividing everyone's language. 
So maintenant, le monde ne peut pas travailler ensemble. So now people are divided into different nations, and these nations each have their own gods. But wouldn't it be cool if there was one nation specifically devoted to the one true God? So God chose Abraham to be the father of his people, and God updated the covenant saying that God's going to make a nation that he's going to use to fix the world. God promised Abraham he's going to have as many kids as the stars in the sky. And Abraham was like, how's that going to be possible? My wife is super old. But Abraham still had faith in God's covenant. So does that mean he's the chosen one who's going to defeat Satan? Well, sadly, no, because Abraham still sinned by telling the king that his wife was really his sister. But they do have kids. This one struggled with God, so he got the name Israel, which means struggled with God. And his children are going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. He struggled with God because sin is still a problem. If you think your family is bad, this one was so dysfunctional that they sent Joseph to slavery in Egypt. But while he was there, God gave him the ability to protect Egypt from starving to death. So now Egypt loves Joseph, and in a great act of forgiveness, Joseph invited the rest of his family back to live with him in Egypt. So God was glorified through his people by turning a bad thing into a good thing. At first, Egypt likes the Israelites, but when they multiply a lot, Egypt stops liking them and enslaves them instead. Moses is one of the Israelites, and when he sees an Egyptian beating another Israelite, he kills the Egyptian. Come on, Israelites, let's rise up. Bro, you're gonna get us in trouble... So Moses has to flee Egypt, and he moves to the middle of nowhere, joins a sheep farm, gets married, and lives happily ever after. But one day, God appears to Moses in a burning bush, saying it's finally time for the Israelites to have that land God promised them. So God tells Moses to tell the leader of Egypt to let his people go. So Moses goes back to Egypt and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. No. But God gives Moses the ability to cause plagues in Egypt. Let my people go, or the river turns to blood. No. Or you get frogs everywhere. No. Gnats. No. Flies. No. Dead livestock, no. Boils, no. Hail, no. Locusts, no. Darkness, no. Let us go or your firstborn sons will die, no. But then the firstborn sons die, so the Pharaoh's like, okay, fine, you can leave. So the Israelites set out for the promised land, but when they're about halfway there, Egypt changes its mind and sends the army after them to bring them back. They corner them by the Red Sea. We've got you surrounded. Oh yeah, says Moses, watch this. So the waters of the Red Sea part, the Israelites escape, but when the Egyptians try to follow them, they unpart and they all die. On their journey, they take a rest stop at Mount Sinai so God can give them the law for when they live in the promised land. Moses will go up to the top of the mountain to receive the law, so he says, Don't worship any false gods while I'm gone. Bro, I'm bored. Let's worship some false gods. <laughs> so they make a golden calf and worship it. Meanwhile, on the top of the mountain, the presence of God descends upon the mountain. This is great. I wish this is how I originally learned. The I know. Bible I just gotta I say, up. props to the Redeem Zoomer, man. It's nice to like see a little bit of comedic, you know, aspect added into yep. to this because it's, it's he's you can done handle a very it. Good job. If you're among those that can handle it, yeah. I, I, li I like it. Yeah, good, good stuff. And we're we're about uh, one third through this, and we're only to Mount Sinai. We still got a ways ways to get to the the yeah. end of the Bible. Still haven't even heard about Jesus yet. Yeah. And Moses receives the law on stone tablets, including the Ten Commandments. But when Moses goes back down and sees the Israelites worshiping a false god, he gets so mad he smashes the stone tablets. So he goes back up the mountain and gets new stone tablets. And God adds to the covenant, saying he's going to give the people the law and the land if they're faithful to the covenant. So let's see how faithful they're going to be. The people are approaching the promised land, but the evil Canaanites already live there. They have strong fortresses and big scary soldiers, and the Israelites are going to have to fight them to take over the land. Come on guys, be brave. God's going to be with you. No, we're too afraid. So the Israelites turn away, they don't invade the land, which means they did not have faith in God's covenant. So their punishment is they have to wander around the Sinai Desert for 40 years. But what about Moses? He didn't do anything wrong. So maybe he's the chosen one who's going to defeat Satan? Well, no, Moses still sinned by doing a miracle the wrong way, so his punishment is he's going to die before he gets to enter the promised land. But then the next generation of Israelites, led by Joshua, does enter the land, uses trumpets to smash the city of Jericho, and drives out the rest of the Canaanites. Cool, now we finally have our land, but who's going to rule us? So God appoints judges to rule over the people and defend them from the enemy nations. Because during this time, there's a pattern that goes something like this. There's peace in the land, but then people get lazy and forget about God, so God lets their enemies conquer them, but then people turn back to God, so God strengthens them to reconquer their land and there's peace in the land again. This pattern repeats many, many times with many, many different judges and people are starting to get sick of it. Bro, why can't we just have a king? Trust me, you don't want a king, says Samuel. Come on, everyone. You know what's interesting about that cycle is that you don't need, like, like, 
I see that it's being told through like a biblical lens there, but isn't that like the story of like everyone everywhere? Everything. So sometimes, depending on how you look at it, like it's you like learn a lesson. Everything, everything is cycles. Yeah, like you learn a lesson, you buckle down, you yeah. start doing the right things, then you get complacent and yeah. you forget about the lesson that you learned right. after everything gets good again, and right. then you, the cycle starts all over again. Right, and you could focus in, you could realize that at any step of the cycle. Yeah. Oh, I'm in sin again. Wait a yeah. sec, let me retrace my steps. How did I get back to sin again? Yeah. It's like, uh, kind of reminds me of this, of the, you know, the cycle of samsara or whatever. Uh. You know? Yeah, I for, yeah, forget exactly what that was all about. Yeah, I, I hope I'm using the right word, yeah, but it's yeah. like the, it's reflected in mm. other religions too. Yeah, yeah. When else has a king? Okay, fine, says Samuel, but the king's going to be oppressive. So Samuel anoints Saul as king, and sure enough, Saul is an oppressive ruler. You know who would be a better ruler? This young kid, David. He's just a shepherd and a string player, so no one takes him seriously. But one day, a huge, scary caveman warrior, Goliath, shows up to fight the Israelites. Okay, guys, who wants to fight Goliath? I'll do it, says David. So David takes out his slingshot, hits Goliath in the head with a rock, and kills him. So now David's a hero, and everyone loves David, and Saul is getting pretty jealous of David. Especially because all the girls are chanting, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. So Saul wants to kill David. So David flees, and Saul pursues him. But one day, David gets a golden opportunity to kill Saul while he's using the bathroom, but he doesn't, so Saul forgives David. But one day, Saul dies to avoid being captured, so David becomes the next king. This is awesome. It starts out really well, and David gains a lot of victories for his kingdom. Maybe he's the chosen one that's going to defeat Satan. Except no. David sins because he likes this one woman, so he has her husband killed in battle so he can steal her. So God makes everything go downhill for David after that. But God still promises that one of David's descendants will be the king that he couldn't be, have a kingdom that covers the entire world and lasts forever. So let's add this to the covenant. Maybe David's son, Solomon, can do it. He's off to a great start, asking God for wisdom and then writing down a bunch of wise sayings, which impresses all the kings and queens of the earth who want to learn from Solomon. And furthermore, Solomon builds a huge beautiful temple to glorify God. So right now his kingdom is a shining beacon of light to the world, and God is glorified through his people. So maybe Solomon's that future king who's going to rule the entire world. Except no, Solomon sins by having a bunch of wives and mistresses, some of whom are not Israelite, so Solomon ends up worshipping foreign gods, and then everything goes downhill for Solomon as well. And after this, things kind of went downhill for the kingdom as a whole because people kept sinning more. The kingdom split into Israel and Judah, and both kingdoms got evil kings who worshipped pagan gods. But it's not like everything was bad during this time period, because a lot of great prophets arose who encouraged people to turn back to God. And even when the temple was literally being used as a place of demon worship, God never told the prophets to abandon the temple, but instead to restore, revive, and retake the temple. And there were actually some good kings who listened to them and reformed the temple, encouraging people to remember God's covenant. But even with all this, eventually Israel was eaten by Assyria, Judah was eaten by Babylon, they smashed the temple, and the Israelites were carried off to exile. Eventually, Persia got a nice king who let the Israelites go back to their land, and even gave them money to rebuild their temple. Maybe now it's finally time for that eternal kingdom. So they're rebuilding the temple. Yo, this is gonna be so great! I don't know, man. It's just not like it was before. They were kind of disappointed that it wasn't time for the eternal kingdom yet, but they still had faith in God's covenant that that was going to happen eventually. And the prophets started focusing a lot on this future king, giving him names like Messiah, or the Son of Man. Daniel said that this kingdom would outlast all the other kingdoms. Micah said this king would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said this king would suffer for the sins of his people. And Zechariah said God will send God to live with us. Does that mean this king is going to be God? Everyone's wondering about this Messiah. When is he going to come, and who is he going to be? An Israelite woman named Mary sees an angel who says she's going to have a baby. The baby's going to be a king, just like his ancestor David, and his kingdom is never going to end. Bro, I'm literally a virgin. That's okay, the Holy Spirit will give you a baby, so your baby is literally going to be the Son of God. Alright, so Mary gives birth to Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem, and calls him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think there was a prophecy about that. And three wise men show up to the party because of a star that they saw. Hi, is this where the king was born? We have some presents for him. But then Herod heard that a great king was just born in Bethlehem. King of Israel, you say? I'm the only king around here. I think there was a prophecy about this. So King Herod got really jealous and ordered people to go to Bethlehem to kill this new baby king. 
so Mary and her husband Joseph had to flee Bethlehem and go to Egypt until it was safe to come back. I think there was a prophecy about this. When Jesus grows up, his first miracle is actually making wine for a party because his mom told him to. But his real ministry doesn't start until he's baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a guy in the wilderness who baptizes people and tells them to turn back to God. I think there was a prophecy about this. But when Jesus is baptized, God declares that Jesus is his son and sends the Holy Spirit upon him. Right after that, Jesus went into the desert and ate nothing for 40 days. And that's when Satan tried to tempt Jesus to sin. But he didn't sin. Up until now, John the Baptist was preaching about the kingdom of God, but then he went to jail. So Jesus takes over, which makes sense because he's actually the king. So what's the kingdom of God like? Jesus said the kingdom of God brings liberation to the oppressed and is good news for poor people, not just rich people. That those who are poor and sad now are going to inherit the entire world, and that this kingdom is the fulfillment of everything God promised. But he doesn't just tell people what the kingdom of God is, he shows them by casting out demons, healing the sick, and forgiving people's sins. He's going on tour through all the towns in the land, doing all sorts of miracles, and everyone is amazed, except the people from his hometown, because it's embarrassing that they knew him as a kid. Jesus chose 12 helpers, and more and more people became his followers. A lot of people loved Jesus, but- I thought that was uh, good that they pointed out the fact that he wasn't accepted by his, yeah. his own his own kind, you know? What's that verse? A prophet will never be accepted in his, his hometown. Hometown? Or something like that. You it could seems to in... always be the case. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I get because, like, Usually as you grow, you build in like kind of wisdom and stature and, you know, the childlike self of you, that's what people have imprinted on them. All the goofiness, all the stupid stuff you did when you were younger, all the times you messed up, everyone knows. And I, I can imagine it being hard to be accepting of the fact that, wow, that, that person like really made themselves into like a beacon of something. Yeah. Um, and, Test it out on yourself. Think of somebody that you found particularly reprehensible growing up and be like, yeah. What if I ran into them now and they were just way different? It's odd. You yeah. know what I mean? And not that you, initially you might not even embrace it and be like, okay, all right, it's been some time. I guess you may have changed. But oh, if you were hanging out with all the hanging out with them for a bunch, you might slip into old patterns and be like, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, and, yeah. And all of a sudden, it's maybe it even causes the person who has changed to be like, oh, I can't go back there. I yeah, end up like yeah. being the way I used to be, even. Yeah, yeah. Good, good point. You know I mean? But some people who did not love him were the Pharisees. They were obsessed with following all the rules, hoping to impress God so he would give back their kingdom. Because right now the Israelites, or I guess now they're called Jews, were living under the Roman Empire, which was run by Gentiles, which are people who are not Jewish people. And the Pharisees were hoping to bring back the kingdom of Israel, but Jesus' kingdom seemed to be about something different. They didn't like how Jesus hung out with sinners, forgave other people's sins, welcomed Gentiles, told them to pay taxes to Rome, and challenged their authority. So they thought Jesus was not the real Messiah. But then one day on the top of a mountain, Jesus was transfigured in front of other people, and Moses and Elijah, big important people from the Old Testament, appeared next to him. So that made the Pharisees look really stupid. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the most important city where the temple was, he was greeted like a king with people waving palm tree branches. And people were even worshipping Jesus, which made the Pharisees really mad. Everyone knows you're only supposed to worship God. So if Jesus is accepting worship, either he's God or he's blaspheming. And I think you know which one the Pharisees went with. So they plotted to kill Jesus. Jesus was predicting this, so he summoned all his disciples for one last supper. He took bread and wine, saying the bread was his body and the wine was his blood, and we should do this in remembrance of him. And he made a new covenant promising forgiveness of sins. And he said that one of the disciples would betray him. Sure enough, this one betrayed Jesus by helping people arrest him. He did it because he was paid to. Some of the other disciples tried to fight back, but Jesus told them not to do that because this all needs to happen. Jesus was handed over to the Roman soldiers led by Pontius Pilate, who killed him by hanging him on a cross. If you're wondering how painful crucifixion is, it's where we get the word excruciating from. Once Jesus died, there was darkness, and one of the soldiers was like, uh, guys, I think we just crucified the Son of God. I think there was a prophecy about this. So Jesus totally could have stopped this from happening, so why didn't he? Well, you may remember, everything kept failing because people kept sinning. Jesus was the only one who didn't sin, so he made a sacrifice for sin to solve the problem of sin. And people realized Jesus was indeed the Messiah, or the Christ. Jesus was buried in a tomb. On the third day, some women came to visit the tomb and found the tomb empty. Then Jesus appeared alive to the women. Then Jesus appeared alive to the disciples. Thomas had his doubts at first, but then he believed and realized Jesus was God. 
So they all worship Jesus because they realize Jesus was the chosen one who defeated Satan. He defeated Satan by defeating death when he rose from the dead. And Jesus ate a fish to prove that his resurrection was physical. Then Jesus gave them the ultimate Bible study, explaining how all the scriptures were about him. He was doing this to train them to build the church. Hold up, why do we have to do this? Isn't Jesus going to start his kingdom now? Well, Jesus said it wasn't for them to know when that was going to happen, but for now, the church is the kingdom. And he commanded them to baptize people all over the world and convert all the nations. And with that, Jesus ascended into heaven, but he promised he would come back one day. And in the meantime, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower them to build the church. So now Jesus is in heaven, but it's not like he's gone. He's ruling over his kingdom from heaven through the church. And when he comes back, he's going to bring heaven down to earth to redeem it. You know how Jesus rose from the dead? He's going to raise everyone from the dead on Judgment Day. He's going to throw Satan into hell finally. And he's even going to throw death into hell so death won't exist anymore. And we can finally eat from the tree of life and live in a perfect world forever. So why does everything exist? It all exists for Jesus and for his kingdom. He's going to conquer everything and make all bad things good. The question is, do you want to be a part of that? Well, another great video by Redeem Zoomer. I thought he did a fantastic job yes. of being able to squeeze that all all in there. Love right? The, love the animation and uh, good. I think at not uh, you know that was pretty right like right down the middle of what you could do for like a Christian video because there's lots of different beliefs inside of Christianity. You know, I think he did a good job of trying just to stay as true to like the basic story as you possibly could. Could I, thought was, I thought it was dynamite. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was great. I feel yeah. like mentioning um, the miracles. I feel like yeah. mentioning that on Jesus' time on the earth, he raised somebody from the dead. Yeah. He did turn a bunch of water into wine at a wedding. Mm. Um, he healed, I guess, countless yeah. lepers, lepers and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. Um, and some of the things he mentioned were that that his followers will do more, greater things in yeah. his name. And what was one of the things? You shall take up snakes and you shall be able to drink dangerous poison and yeah. not be affected. Now, that's not me saying go do those things. But it does make me wonder. You know, the Holy Spirit was sent down to embolden us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm a bit of a, like, kind of a rascally, ne'er-do-well, troublemaker -y type guy. You know, yeah. when I was in the church, I'd be like, well, I want to do miracles. You know, let's get some miracles cooking then. Yeah. You know, and I don't really necessarily buy it if someone's like, Matt, we were under budget and magically we got the money. Like, yeah. that's wonderful. And maybe it is miraculous, but that's not the type of miracle I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about we got the Holy Spirit. Let's float already. Let's, yeah, yeah. you know, like manifest and all kinds yeah. of stuff and, you know, do things that are undeniable. Um, I question you know some I'm things. Yeah, I got like... I have a hard time with a lot of the miracle stuff, like because I'm always brought back to thinking about that that verse where Jesus said, uh, "Like people will do greater things than me," like, and then I'm like, "Did we not understand something, or was something not written down correctly?" Because yeah. like, what are we talking about in terms of like miracles? Like, no one's walking into sick kids' hospital and healing them. So, what do you mean by miracles? Maybe. There's something like a something different to be understood about what we think about miracles. Got to use our imagination here. Lest you yeah. become like young children, lest you become like little children, you shall not, shall not enter the, the kingdom. Yeah. You know, that's like a verse. I find aspects of the Bible moving and that story yeah. is very compelling. But we watch a lot of religions on yeah, here yeah, yeah. that I find moving and compelling. Yeah. You know, I would hope that when Jesus returns, I could be like, Hosanna. And he won't be like, hey, you didn't. You didn't describe yourself as a Christian, though. Like, yeah. Yeah. like that. I hope that wouldn't happen. Yeah. But because I not, well, we try to indulge in all the religions that we cover here. Yeah, it's not about what you you know profess to be, but what do your actions say about the life that you live? Well, what if it's not even like about that yeah. though? Yeah. You know, like I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. but the the bottom line is, how do you get to the root of the cut? How do you not just be a Pharisee again? Yeah. How do you not do it? And what difference does it make? People are going to choose their path. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, if you want to be a Pharisee, be a Pharisee. But, you know, it's just, I hear the story, but I just thought I would point out some things because I'm yeah. a troublemaker. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> That's what I am. You just like to, to, I don't know, stimulate thought and thinking about things from a different angle. Hey, man, Doting Thomas was, mm -hmm. he got to stick his fingers right into the wound. He was cl very close oh, yes. to Christ because he was like, I don't believe it. And then yeah. Jesus was like, look, I'm here. Grab me. 
sometimes I feel a little bit like doubting Thomas, you know? Yeah. No, Just I, I want to see it. I want to, you know, if it's real, I want to see it. To, to touch it, taste it, feel it. And that goes for everything we learn here. All right, guys. Hopefully you liked our reaction on this one. Another good one by the Redeem Zoomer. If you did, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, share this with a friend, and everyone, until next time, stay, stay spiritual. spiritual.